April 3rd, 1971. Two days ago, spaceship Discovery, accompanied by eight huge freighter ships, took off from the launching ground on the moon on the first stage of its six-month-long, 355-million-mile journey to Mars. Fifty-one hours later, the Mars fleet was coasting out from the sun toward the red planet's orbit in a prearranged formation. When cargo ship number two reported that her rocket motor had not been working efficiently and that the powerful two-way radio was also faulty, Jet decided to transfer our motor engineer, Mitch, and radio mechanic, Lemmy, to the freighter in the hope that they would trace the faults. Five minutes later, the two men were in the airlock and ready to leave. Who's going first? You. Fasten your safety line and push off. There's enough length to allow you to reach the other ship. When you get there, fasten your short line. Then I'll hook the end of your long line to myself, and you pull me across. Yeah, Mitch. And don't pull too hard. Do me a favor. Am I likely to? Uh, just being careful, that's all. Don't want to crash up on the side of that ship. Are you ready? Fasten your line and make sure it's fast. There. All right, now. Push. I'll keep a hold of the line. If you push too hard, I'll hold you back. Then here I go. There he goes. Cautious, wasn't he? He's hardly moving. Uh, better that than too fast. Blimey. Is something wrong, Lemmy? No, Jack. Just a weird feeling, that's all. Suspended out here. In nothing. <laughs> it's perfectly safe. It don't feel like it. He's nearly there. Ah. Made it. Fasten your short line, Lemmy. Short line, Falson. Now attaching long line to belt. Right, Lemmy? You ready? Yes, Mitch. Then haul away. And slowly. Taking up the slack. Line tight. Hey, Mitch, where are you going? What are you doing up there? It's just like you was a kite and I was flying you. Don't pull on the line, you fool. Lemmy! Oh, Lemmy! Blimey. Blimey, it's come off. The line's come unfastened. Jet! Hello? J the, 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 the line's come loose. Mitch is adrift. He's drifting away. Good heaven, Doc, he is. Jet! Jet! Hold on, Mitch. Don't panic. Lemmy, can you hear me? Yes, Jet. Haul in the line, then throw it towards Mitch. Right. He'll have to look lively. Mitch is definitely drifting off. Yes, but only slowly. The line should be long enough to reach him. You ready, Mitch? Oh, what do you think? And make it a good shot, Lemmy, for Pete's sake. Right. Here it comes. Oh, miles wide of him. I'm sorry, Mitch. I'll try again. Don't get my suit. I may have to go out there myself. Sure, Jet. Now, Mitch, you ready? Yeah, Lemmy. Now, you try and grab it, boys. It comes by. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, here it comes. Oh, Lemmy, can't you throw it straighter than that? I'm sorry, Jet. I'm doing my best. It's this suit. It makes it so difficult. All right, all right. Now, just keep calm. Have another try. I'm sorry, Mitch. But take your time, Lemmy. Now, slowly does it. Mitch must be at least five yards further away by now. A good throw this time should make it. And if it doesn't? Call up the pilot to freight another two, will you, Doc? Sure. Right, Mitch. I'll do it this time if it kills me. Now, you ready? Yeah, Lemmy. And if you want me to be with you at the end of this trip, make it good. Hello, freighter number two. Flagship calling. Hello, flagship number two calling. Stand by. Captain Morgan wants you. Okay. Now, get ready, Mitch. Here it comes. Oh, good shot, Lemmy. Doc, he made... Oh, no. What now? A dead straight throw, but Mitch can't reach it. What? He's drifted too far. Get the airlock ready to let me out. You bet. Stretch for it, Mitch, mate. You might just make it. I... I can't. It's six inches too short. Hello, Mitch. Yeah, Jeff. Hang on, I'm coming out. Lemmy. Yes, Jeff. Get inside number two's airlock. I'm going to ask the crew to let you in. What? And leave Mitch out there? I'm drifting away into... into... Eternity. Lemmy, do as you're told, and don't argue. Ah, now enter an airlock. Hello, number two. Hearing you loud and clear. Let Lemmy in, will you, and put Whitaker on. Yes, sir. Whitaker here. Whitaker, go into the cargo compartment and get a construction engineer's rocket propulsion unit. When Lemmy gets inside, give it to him. Yes, sir. All right, Doc. Let me out. Airlock contact. Shh. Helmet fastened. Exhaust the airlock. Contact. Suit inflating. Air pressure zero. Open the door lock. Hello, Jet. Can you hear me? Yes, Lemmy. I'll be in number two's cabin any minute. Now, what do I do when I get there? Whitaker will give you a propulsion unit. Take it. Come out again and wait by the main door. Is that clear? Right. Doc. Hey, Doc. Yeah, Jet. Mitch, I, I can't see him. I'm about 150 yards up, out of your line of vision. Oh. Can you see him on the teleview, Doc? Yes, Jet, I can. He's directly over the ship. 
drifting further away all the time. Well, thanks, Doc, for those comforting words. Fastening long safety line to ship. What are you going to do, Jet? Give myself a push and drift over to number two. Uh, Lemmy, can you hear me? Yes, Jet. I'm in the airlock again now. I'll be out in just a minute. Here I go, Doc. Pushing off. Ah, hello, Mitch. Hello, Jet. I can see you now. Hope to be alongside you in a few minutes. Oh, make it snappy, Jet. I'm way above the ship now. Main door of number two opening. And there's Lemmy, Jet. Lemmy. Yes, Doc? Jet's on his way. So I can see. He's almost there. Ah, he's made it. Uh, hello, Lemmy. Uh, help me fix that propulsion unit. Hey, you're going up after him? What else? Ah, oh, but the line doesn't carry that far. You'll never reach him. Is she secure? Yeah, I think so, but... Now, listen to me carefully. With the help of that rocket unit, I'm going to head towards Mitch. But the line isn't long enough for you to... As soon as it's paid out, I'm going to let go. I'll pick up Mitch and then come back to the end of the rope, so don't draw it back. But will it stay put? Ah, of course it will. There's so little gravity out here, it'll remain in position for hours. Now, you ready? Ah, oh, but Jet, listen, if, if, if you let go of that line, you'll be adrift too, and then... Here, mate, let me do it. You're more important to this expedition than me. Fasten the rope, Lemmy. But Jet... Fasten it... the line. Hitch in the line. Line secure. Now, give the free end a, a couple of turns around my wrist. There. Hello, Mitch. Yet, yet. Did you hear all that? Uh, too right. Then here I come. Not too fast, Jet. Don't overshoot. Oh, blimey. Careful, Jet. It's only a short way you're going, not back to the Earth. Oh, I'll have to take it easier next stage. Now, leaving end of safety line. How are you going to find your way back to Mitch traveling backwards? It's up to you to direct me. All oh, right. Uh, you're about halfway there. Now, continue slowly in the same direction. You're drifting towards him now, but a little too low. Now point the nozzle downwards. Smack on. Grab him, Mitch. Right, Jet. Gotcha. Oh, thank goodness. Now hang on tight, Mitch. Now I'll have to maneuver a bit to turn us. Nearly round, Jet. About there. Right. Now straighten up. Keep going. Slowly. You'll make it. Now the rope's directly behind you. Easy does it. If you can see it, Mitch, grab that line. Got it! Can you keep hold of it? I think so. All right, Lemmy, haul us back. Oh, we're safe now, Mitch. The panic's over. <laughs> oh, thanks, Jet. I, I thought I'd, I'd seen the last of you discovering everything else. Now, as soon as your boots grip the hull, make your way into the airlock. Do right, I will. Yeah. Oh, that's it, Mitch boy. Home again. I thought we'd lost you that time. Get into the airlock, both of you. But what about your safety line? Sticking out from Discovery like it was performing the Indian rope trick. Oh, we can stay there for now. We'll need it to help us back anyway. Uh, hello, Doc. Matthew speaking. I'll see Mitch safely inside. If he's okay, I'll leave him to get on with the job and then come back. Uh, you all right on your own for a spell? Sure, don't worry about me. Good. And I'll call you again from number two in a few minutes. Yes, Jack. And nice work. What do you say, Mitch? Too right. <laughs> So Mitch was saved, but it had been a close call. The propulsion unit by which Jet was able to reach Mitch was a miniature rocket motor, looking rather like a hand fire extinguisher. It was designed to be used by the construction engineers when, above the Martian surface, they'd leave their ships to transfer to Discovery the equipment that was to be ferried down to the landing area. No engineer would dare move about outside the ship without first attaching his safety line so that, in the event of anything going wrong with the propulsion unit, he could be hauled back to his ship by hand. And so, for Jet to deliberately propel himself into the void without a safety line had been an extremely risky undertaking. However, once Mitch had been brought back, the incident was quickly put out of mind. A few minutes later, the three men were safely inside the ship and setting about the task of finding out what was wrong with freighter number two. How soon did she begin losing thrust, Frank? Soon after we'd reached maximum acceleration. Hmm. Uh, can I see the log? Yes, Skipper. If you get a step over to the control table. Uh, how about that radio, Lemmy? Any idea what's wrong with that? Amplifying circuit of the main receiver. Getting less than half the current through her that she should have. I think I'll have to take her in and out. Oh, will it be a long job? Probably. I can't say yet. Well, let me know as soon as you can. I don't like Doc being di in Discovery on his own. Well, you can talk to him if you want to. I won't be interfering with the ship-to-ship -ship system. Well, yet, so far as I can judge, the motor trouble is way deep down in the hull someplace. Uh, can you get at it, Mitch? Put it right. 
Not without every engineer we got with us working on it. We'd have to take a whole section of the ship to pieces. We haven't the tools for the job. Can't even get near it for weeks. The motor's still highly radioactive. God. Then what do you suggest? That we leave it alone and hope. Yeah, but how about when we begin to approach Mars and have to slow down? She'll have to be working properly then. Well, if in spite of the trouble the motor's got the ship this far, she should function well enough to slow her down too. But she'll probably eat up an awful lot of fuel. Will there be enough in the tanks to do the job? Well, we'll have to make sure there is. We'll take some of the spare fuel from the storage tanks and fill her up. Yes, but that'll leave us short during the exploration period. I know, but it's either that or risking losing the ship. Oh, very well, Mitch. If that's your opinion, we'll have the fuel transferred, but we'll have to wait until she stopped boiling. We can't risk the fueling squads getting contaminated. Well, we've got months of coasting before we need to get down to it. Mm. How about you, Lemmy? Well, with luck, I think I would have traced this trouble within an hour. As long as that? Well, you want me to do the job properly, don't you? Of course I do, but I don't want to leave Doc alone in the flagship for longer than I can help, either. Yeah, I think I'll have to leave you here, Lemmy. Well, it suits me. As soon as you're ready to make the transfer, let me know. I'll be at the main door to see you make it safely. Right. Uh, come on, Mitch, let's get back to our own ship. Yeah. Uh, open up the airlock, will you, Whitaker? Yes, sir. Make sure your line's secure this time, Skipper. <laughs> you're damn right I will. Airlock. Nice to know you're still with us. Yeah, it was a close thing, Doc, and no mistake. Hey, Doc, take this, will you? Huh? Oh, the propulsion unit. Yeah. We'll keep it in this ship in case we need it again. Oh, well, if we'd had it before, Mitch could have brought himself back. Had we known it was going to be needed before we got to Mars, it would have been here. Then we will be bringing over another one when he returns, so from now on, nobody leaves the ship without a propulsion unit. What happened, Mitch? How did you come adrift? I wish I knew, Doc. What? You mean you don't? No, Jet. That line was hooked to me. I swear the safety catch was definitely secure. Then how did it come apart? Search me. Here. Here, look at, look at my belt. There's nothing wrong there, is there? No, not that I can see. Nothing wrong with the catch on the end of the safety line either. No? Look, I tell you, there's something screwy somewhere. I would have staked my life on that line being secure. That's just what you did, isn't it, Mitch? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I see what you mean. You better be more careful in future, Mitch. Test the catch before you push off. I tell you, I did. Well, you're not likely to be going outside again. Unless number two shows more signs of trouble. Well, why should she? Well, why shouldn't she? She's shown plenty up to now. Whoever passed that ship was okay ought to be fired. I've half a mind to call up control and tell them to do now, it. Now, hold on, Mitch. It's probably our fault that's developed since we've been underway. You can't blame the inspection engineer for that. Well, it wasn't the first time she'd been faulty. Doc reported me she was down on thrust three days before we took off. But that was put right, Mitch. Oh, looks like it, doesn't it? Now, how about the radio? Doesn't look as though that was properly inspected either. Oh, pure coincidence. Pure incompetence is what I'd call it. If there can be two major faults in one ship like that, how many are there in the other ships? Look, Mitch, you're overwrought. Well, after what you've been through, I'm not surprised. Yeah, come on, Mitch. Get your suit off and lie down and take a rest. I tell you, I, I don't need to rest. While you're on this ship, Mitch, and Doc gives you advice, you'll take it. Now get your suit off. All right. All right, if you say so. I'm not a kid, you know. I know when I feel okay. I don't need you or Doc to tell me different. Can you get him to sleep, Doc? Yeah, sure, Jeff. Leave him to me. I'll fix it. Good. Meanwhile, I'll call up Lemmy, see how he's getting on. All right. Uh, hello, freighter number two. Flagship Discovery calling freighter number two. Freighter number two calling Discovery. Frank Rogers speaking. Uh, put Lemmy on, will you please? Yes, sir. Hello, Jet. Lemmy speaking. How's it going, Lemmy? Well, I know where the trouble is, but it'll be another couple of hours before I put it right. Oh. Don't you worry, boy. Lemmy Barnett's on the job. As soon as everything's ship shape again, I'll let you know. Tell Doc I'll be eating out, will you? And not to worry about my rations. <laughs> All right, but be as quick as you can. I want you back in your own ship as soon as possible. Well, the sooner I get on with the job, the sooner I get back. I'll call you later. Okay, Lemmy. <laughs> this home and here we are. <laughs> now, if you don't get a good reception now, Frank, I'll eat my helmet. Switch on, will you, mate? Right. Hello, Discovery. Freighter number two calling Discovery. Hello, Lemmy. Discovery calling. I'll finish that radio job now. I request permission to contact base for reception test. Go ahead. And let me know the result. Right. Uh, main transmitter, Frank. Main transmitter on. Hello, Earth. Space fleet. Freighter number two calling for reception test. Come in, please. Hello, freighter number two. Receiving you loud and clear. And the same to you. Well, it seems we're okay now, but give us a little more, will you, just to make sure? Twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. You might well ask. A star is about what the Earth is beginning to look like. Well, thanks a lot, Control. Thank you, number two. Well, there you are, Frank. That's that little job jobbed. 
If you don't get control at full possible strength after this, you can return the goods and you get your money back. I suppose you'll be going over to Discovery now. Yep. Just as soon as Whitaker comes back with a propulsion unit for me. Oh. You, uh, you almost sound disappointed. You sure you wouldn't like a little more to eat before you go? What's the matter, Frank? I don't owe you any money, do I? How do you mean? Well, the way you're trying to hang on to me, I thought maybe I did. Oh, it's just that I hoped you might have stayed for a bit. Well, you heard what Jet said. I was to return to Discovery as soon as the job was finished. I'd better call him up, tell him I'm on my way. Well, if you must, I thought we might have had the pleasure of your social company for a bit. Somebody to talk to for a while. You've got Whitaker to talk to. No, Lemmy. I can't talk to him. Hey? Oh, don't tell me you two are fighting only two days out. I couldn't quarrel with him if I tried. Well, why? Has he been struck down or something? No, it's not that. He just doesn't talk. He's about the most unsociable person I've ever met. Then why did you crew up with him? I couldn't help it. I was supposed to crew with Vivis, but he was killed back in Lunar City when the meteor hit living quarters. Oh. So Whitaker's a last-minute replacement? Yeah. I'd hardly time to get acquainted with him before we took off. And after only two days out, you decide you can't get along with him? I defy anybody to. But what's the matter with him? Don't, don't he pull his weight or, or, or... Well, he works all right about the only thing he does do. Never says a word, unless it's absolutely necessary. Well, he doesn't talk about anything else? His, his family or where he comes from or anything? No. Then how does he spend his time? And he's not on duty, mostly lying on his bunk. Reading? No, just lying, waiting for his turn at Radio Watch. Oh, he can't wait to get to that receiver. And when I'm at it, he just lies there, staring at me. Go on. Sometimes when I sit there, feeling his eyes, boring through my back, I feel like throwing the logbook at him. Uh, Frank, you're sure you haven't upset him in any way? Well, if trying to be nice to a fellow who half the time acts as though you're not here is upsetting, then yes, I have. Well, maybe that's the trouble. What? Huh? Yeah, you're trying to be too nice to him. He just doesn't like it. That's not the reason, Lemmy. goes deeper than that. He's a queer customer all round. How do you mean? Twenty-four hours out from Earth, I was on watch, sitting at the radio, and he was asleep on his bunk as usual. I was waiting for a velocity check from control. It was late in coming. And? I thought maybe the receiver had drifted off frequency and began to fiddle with the controls. And I happened to turn round and found Whitaker standing right behind me. It gave me quite a shock. I don't know how long he'd been there. What did you say to him? I asked him what he wanted and if he couldn't sleep. But he didn't reply. He just stood there, listening. And then? Mitch came through on the ship-to-ship -ship system asking for routine checks, and Whitaker went back to his bunk and lay down. He wasn't sleepwalking. With his eyes open. I've heard that's possible. No, Lemmy. I don't think he was sleepwalking. <laughs> you sure you hadn't hypnotised him or anything? I'm not joking, Lemmy. <laughs> no, mate. Sometimes I think he must be in a trance, doesn't even know I'm here. Well, if he were, how could he carry out his work? Oh, he does that all right, as well as the next... In fact, he doesn't miss a thing where work is concerned, only sometimes... Oh? You don't think I'm crazy, do you, Lemmy? As if I'd think a thing like that. Well, sometimes it's as though he's not the only one here. Yeah, well... Hey? Well, he is, but... Well, it's not him, if you know what I mean. Yeah, I... Uh... I tell you, Lemmy, if I have six months of this all the way to Mars, I'll go crackers. Uh, look, 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 Frank... Why don't you tell Jet about all this? Oh, he's got enough on his mind without having to shoulder my troubles, too. Yeah, but we all know that living for weeks in a cons confined space with somebody you, you can't get on with is, is not too easy. You begin to see something wrong in everything they do, the way they eat, the way they walk, the way they hold their cigarettes yes. if they smoke, the way they watch you smoke in yours if they don't. All maddening, irritating little things. But they could drive you off your rocker in no time. You might even start getting violent. I might at that. Yeah. Look, if Jet thinks you've got a good case, he'll get either you or Whitaker transferred to another ship before any real trouble starts. Hold it. Here he comes. Oh. Uh, uh, well, you, you treat her gently, Frank, and she'll treat you kindly. The, why, the way she's behaving now, she'll pick up a signal from Jupiter if there's anybody up there to send one, which there ain't. So if you find you're getting nothing, you know just where you're getting from. <laughs> your hey? pulsion unit, Mr. Barnett. Oh. Oh, thank you, uh, Mr. Whittaker, look, uh, the men on this trip usually call me Lemmy. There's no need for you to be formal, you know. Shall I help you on with it? Yeah. Yes, thank you. Not that I'll be needing it. When I push off from this ship, my line will be fast. You won't find me drifting off, as Mitch did. I'm sure he thought the same thing before his line disconnected. Hmm. You're a little comfort, ain't you? It's fixed now, Mr. Barnett. I'll call Captain Morgan. Tell him you're ready. Yes, you do that. And thank you. See what I mean? 
Don't you worry, Frank boy. I'll tell Jet about this. I'll see what he thinks of it. Thanks, Lemmy. I'll be grateful. <laughs> When Lemmy returned to the discovery, he reported the conversation he'd had with Frank Rogers about Whitaker, the construction engineer. Jet, Mitch, and I listened with little concern. Rogers had probably exaggerated the whole business, and Lemmy had been too gullible. Men were bound to be upset by space conditions, particularly during the first day or so after takeoff, before their bodies were fully attuned to the strange sensations brought about by the lack of gravity and the closely confined living quarters. Some men were affected physically, were subjected to violent attacks of nausea. Others became depressed, sullen, even apathetic. But all these space-induced maladies were easily controlled by a little determination and willpower, and after a maximum of two days, most crew members felt themselves again. We concluded that Whittaker was suffering from an acute attack of space sickness and was taking more time to get over it than most. Rogers was told of our opinion and rather reluctantly agreed to be patient, see whether Whittaker's attitude would improve. Meanwhile, the huge ships of the Mars space fleet were coasting on their way, out from the sun and towards the orbit of the red planet. Although we'd left the Earth's orbit, it was still continuing its own course round the sun and was, as it were, pursuing us. By the time we reached Mars, we would have traveled halfway round the sun, and so would the Earth. In fact, by the time Mars was reached, the Earth would have overtaken us, lie directly between us and the sun, and be approximately 40 million miles away. But to achieve that distance, we had to coast 355 million miles. Had it been possible to travel in a straight line, our journey could have been accomplished in only 55 days. The next two weeks were uneventful. All was well with the fleet. Personnel in all ships, except number two, seemed happy enough. Rogers was told that if his relationship with Whitaker did not improve, one or the other of them would be transferred to another ship. That seemed to cheer Frank considerably, and for a few days, we forgot the affair. Hello, Control. Flagship Discovery calling Control. Come in, please. Hello, Flagship Discovery. Receiving you strength three. Over. Have full recorded report on last six hours ready for transmission. Are you ready to receive it? Yes, Discovery. Stand by. I'll tell you when to start. Right. You know, the time lag between replies gets longer every time we call up. We must be a million miles from Earth at least by now. Two million, Lemmy. Go on. <laughs> Hello, Discovery. Control calling. Ready to take your transmission, but first I have a message for Captain Morgan. Hold on a minute. I'll call him. Hey, Jet. Yes, Lemmy? Control. Got a message for you. What's it about? They didn't say. Hello, Control. Morgan here. Ready for your message. Uh, is the recorder on, Lemmy? Yes, mate. Hello, Captain Morgan. Message for you. Urgent. Concerning Whitaker, crew member of freighter ship number two. What? Whitaker, did you say? Yes. James E. Whitaker, construction engineer, freighter ship number two. Information needed on him by personnel records office. Date of birth, place of birth, nationality. Full personal description, including height, color of hair and eyes, and any special identification marks. Full account of space flight training and experience. Date of entering Astro Engineering College with full details of all engineering qualifications and where obtained. End of message. Hello, Control. Message received. What on earth do you want all that for? Records must have it already. What do they think we are, an information bureau? Sorry, Captain. I don't write these messages. I only pass them on. Then here's one for you to pass on to records from me. That's it, Jack. You tell them. Ready to receive your message? From Captain Morgan aboard Discovery to Personnel Records Office. Cannot understand reason for your request. Is information really necessary? 
Taking no action until reply received. End of message. My bet I made a mistake. It's the police they want. Message received. We'll call you later. Thank you, Control. All right, Lemmy. Keep listening out. Let me know as soon as you get a reply. Well, Jeff, what was all that about? Oh, I'm darned if I know. Want me to check up on Whittaker, huh? something they must have done themselves a year ago. Whittaker? Yeah. Maybe they've lost their information on him and want to keep the record straight. Well, this is a fine time to choose to do it. Three weeks out from takeoff. Well, besides, there's a duplicate copy of everybody's personal dossier down on Earth. Why not ask them for it? Hello, Control. Discovery calling. Hearing you loud and clear. Hey, Jet. Control calling. You're coming, Lemmy. Message from Captain Morgan from Control. Urgent. Repeat. Urgent. Information on Whitaker required as soon as possible. Please take immediate action on previous signal. End of message. Blimey. Persistent and eh? Hello, Control. Morgan speaking. Message received and understood. We'll call again as soon as information has been obtained. Well, Lemmy, seems there's nothing for it but to carry out the order. Haven't they got nothing better to do down there than expect us to carry out records work for them? Hey, call up number two, Lemmy. Get Whitaker for me, will you? Yes, Jet. Hello, Space Fleet. Discovery calling freighter number two. Come in, please. Number two calling Discovery. Uh, Morgan here. Is that Whitaker? Yes, Captain. Uh, look, Whitaker, I'm sorry about this, but I've had a message from Control about you. Yes? I have to ask you a number of questions about yourself for personnel records. All information about me can be found in my personal dossier. Yes, I realize that, but for some reason, Control insists on having it again. Uh, are you ready? Yes. Your name? James Edward Whittaker. Date of birth? 12th September, 1940. Uh-huh. Uh, nationality? British. Uh, place of birth? 12th September, 1940. No, place of birth. British. What's he talking about? Hello, Whittaker. James Edward Whittaker. Blimey, what's happening over there? Hello? Hello? 12th September, 1893. 1893? Whittaker! Whittaker! 12th September, 1893. He must be crackers. Listen, Whittaker, put Rogers on. Rogers is asleep. Then wake him up. He cannot be woken. Wake him up, do you hear? Hello, Whittaker, do you... It sounds like he shut his transmitter off. Hello, Whittaker. Hello. Freighter number two, discovery calling. Hello, 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 hello. hello. It's no good, Jack. He's not replying. What's he up to? And Frank. What about Frank? Hello. 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 towards Mitch. Right. He'll have to look lively. Mitch is definitely drifting off. Yes, but only slowly. A line should be long enough to reach him. You ready, Mitch? Oh, what do you think? And make it a good shot, Lemmy, for Pete's sake. Right. Here it comes. Oh, miles wide of him. I'm sorry, Mitch. I'll try again. Don't get my suit. I may have to go out there myself. Sure, Jet. Now, Mitch, you ready? Yeah, Lemmy. Now, you try and grab it, boys. It comes by. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, here it comes. Oh, Lemmy, can't you throw it straighter than that? I'm sorry, Jet. I'm doing my best. It's this chute. It makes it so difficult. All right, all right. Now, just keep calm. Have another try. I'm sorry, Mitch, but take your time, Lemmy. Now, slowly does it. Mitch must be at least five yards further away by now. A good throw this time should make it. And if it doesn't? Call up the pilot to freight another two, will you, Doc? Sure. Right, Mitch. I'll do it this time if it kills me. Now, you ready? Yeah, Lemmy. And if you want me to be with you at the end of this trip, make it good. Hello, freighter number two, flagship calling. Hello, flagship number two calling. Stand by, Captain Morgan wants you. Okay. Now get ready, Mitch. Here it comes. Oh, good shot, Lemmy. Docky Mitch. Oh, no. What now? A dead straight throw, but Mitch can't reach it. What? He's drifted too far. Get the airlock ready to let me out. You bet. Stretch for it, Mitch, mate. You might just make it. I, I can't. It's six inches too short. Hello, Mitch. Yes, sir. Hang on, I'm coming out. Lemmy. Yes, sir. Get inside number two's airlock. I'm going to ask the crew to let you in. What? And leave Mitch out there? I'm drifting away into, into eternity? Lemmy, do as you're told, and don't argue. Ah, now enter an airlock. 
Hello, number two. Hearing you loud and clear. Let Lemmy in, will you? And put Whitaker on. Yes, sir. Whitaker here. Whitaker, go into the cargo compartment and get a construction engineer's rocket propulsion unit. When Lemmy gets inside, give it to him. Yes, sir. All right, Doc. Let me out. Airlock contact. Helmet fastened. Exhaust the airlock. Contact. Suit inflating. Air pressure zero. Open the door lock. Hello, Jet. Can you hear me? Yes, Lemmy. I'll be in number two's cabin any minute. Now, what do I do when I get there? Whitaker will get... April 3rd, 1971. Two days ago, spaceship Discovery, accompanied by eight huge freighter ships, took off from the launching ground on the moon on the first stage of its six-month-long, 355-million-mile journey to Mars. Fifty-one hours later, the Mars fleet was coasting out from the sun toward the red planet's orbit in a prearranged formation. When cargo ship number two reported that her rocket motor had not been working efficiently and that the powerful two-way radio was also faulty, Jet decided to transfer our motor engineer, Mitch, and radio mechanic, Lemmy, to the freighter in the hope that they would trace the faults. Five minutes later, the two men were in the airlock and ready to leave. Who's going first? You. Fasten your safety line and push off. There's enough length to allow you to reach the other ship. When you get there, fasten your short line. Then I'll hook the end of your long line to myself, and you pull me across. Yeah, Mitch. And don't pull too hard. Do me a favor. Am I likely to? Uh, just being careful, that's all. Don't want to crash up on the side of that ship. Are you ready? Fasten your line and make sure it's fast. There. All right, now. Push. I'll keep a hold of the line. If you push too hard, I'll hold you back. Then here I go. There he goes. Cautious, wasn't he? He's hardly moving. Uh, better that than too fast. Blimey. Is something wrong, Lemmy? No, Jack. Just a weird feeling, that's all. Suspended out here. In nothing. <laughs> it's perfectly safe. It don't feel like it. He's nearly there. Ah. Made it. Fasten your short line, Lemmy. Short line fastened. Now attaching long line to belt. Right, Lemmy? You ready? Yes, Mitch. Then haul away. And slowly. Taking up the slack. Line tight. Hey, Mitch, we...